So I'm going to talk about uh, contributions and, of course, Robin's contribution to contributions. And uh, if I look back, being almost one of the people that Mike would call old, um, if I look back at uh, sort of my research career, then there are uh, three papers that I would call have made me think, wow, and have changed my ideas about what could be done and the way it can be done. And uh, one you've already heard about, which was uh, what uh, Brian was talking about, which was Nicholas and Smith. And uh, Nicholas and Smith, sort of, for me, who was a bit of an outsider to, to animal breeding, it showed me that I didn't have to, to just worry about project testing schemes. It sort of opened up all sorts of possibilities in the way that you could organize a breeding scheme. Uh, the last one, which was in the noughties, you can guess what that would be. That would be Muirson, um, um, gosh, my, my head. Muirson, <laughs> Muirson, Hayes, and Goddard, of course. Uh, but the middle one, was the paper by uh, Rain Thompson. And so I'm going to talk mostly about that paper, or at least targeting myself, my talk towards that paper. And uh, I'm going to have a look at uh, the pedigree of the paper. And obviously the paper is uh, uh, Ray and Thompson. And the first thing that I would put up on that pedigree is a paper by James and McBride, which is 1958, which is 60 years ago. And this paper was called, uh, read it, The Spread of Genes by Natural and Artificial Selection in Closed Poultry Flock, and it appeared in the Journal of Genetics. And what that paper did is it tracked the fractions of genes from foundation parents to descendants over generations. And I think, Bill may correct me if I'm wrong, but I think, and certainly Robin acknowledged it in his paper as well, I think that was the first time that you kind of got the idea of a contribution and a contribution over generations of an individual gene flow. In other words, how much impact did one individual have on a gene pool over a long period of time? And uh, in this poultry flock, they had, it was a closed population, I think, and uh, they had uh, 62 female ancestors, foundation females, and they had 13 foundation males, and they looked it over generations, and uh, as is often typical, if you looked at the females, especially in small populations, although they had 62, a few generations later, 44 were making no contributions at all. And uh, out of the 13 males, three males made contributions. Sorry, didn't make contributions. The other 10 distributed, as you can see here, with two of them dominating, really, and others really very small indeed. And they, in this paper, they actually carried on allocated change as natural or artificial. Natural being whether the egg percentage of, of uh, a mating uh, translated into candidate percentage. And uh, if there was a difference, that was ascribed to being some sort of natural selection. And uh, if it was... Uh, and then they also looked at how the candidate percentage of a, a parent changed to being a mating percentage, which was the artificial uh, selection. And, of course, you know, whether they, are, they concluded that 70% of this was by spread. Now, of course, we wouldn't uh, think that we could do that so easily and perhaps separate it out. But, of course, this, this was really quite uh, forward-looking at that time. But the key points... The key point is that it was tracking individual gene flow. 
what we would recognize as contributions, long-term contributions, and that the change, and they had the idea that change in the amounts an individual may contribute over generations were associated with some selective advantages because they concluded it was a result of the progeny test, and that these changes occur over generations and not just one. So, and then we'll perhaps have a little bit of selfing, and we'll get to uh, my second paper in the pedigree, which is something by Robin himself, which is 77. And uh, Robin, I think, has always been very keen on decompositions of A matrices. And this is one of those papers. And it comes under this wonderful title, The Estimation of Heritability with Unbalanced Data, data available on more than two generations. And that's in Biometrics 33. And uh, it's equivalent to a decomposition of Wright's numerator relationship matrix. I originally had this slide that it was actually a decomposition of the A matrix. And then I thought, well, some of these terms look rather strange. And... Uh, then I realized that actually what he was doing was decomposing the kinship, what I would call the kinship matrix. It wasn't the relationship matrix. He, was, he kind of referred to it at the end of the paper. So it rather surprised me that, in fact, the, the decomposition was on the kinship. Of course, it, as we know, it, would, it may, makes no difference. It's the principles that were going into it that were important. And here, you'll be familiar with these terms. You have matrices, matrices relating offspring, at uh, time one time to the parents of the previous time, and a diagonal matrix of variance, or indeed in sampling terms. Or, which is why I've got them in quotes, because of course this is in a kinship matrix. Uh, and if you look at that paper, the decomposition that Robin was developing and was pointing to was this uh, essentially an emergence of a form where you can, this decomposition of long-term contributions of particular generations. And identifying in that uh, relationship matrix, kinship matrix, relationship matrix, those elements that uh, uh, were actually the contributions of ancestors to their descendants. And Robin notes that uh, in that paper that he sort of notes in that paper at that time that uh, the, these uh, contributions are, that these are actually contributions relating to numbers of descendants for particular generations. And I didn't think it was quite ready for the Ray and Thompson paper, so I had to introduce a, a phantom paper, which I think all could have been written about the combination of those two. So in my pedigree, I have to have a phantom paper to do this, because we're missing one very important contribution to uh, the Ray and Thompson paper. And that is Robertson, 1961. And Robertson's paper is called Inbreeding in Artificial Selection Programs, and it appeared in Genetical Research in 61. And this is, this is a paper which has had papers written about it on what on earth was it talking about, or something equivalent to that, because it is a really quite a curious paper, and, uh, and brilliant at the same time. Um, so, this is the paper it is. And it, first of all, that introduction notes some things. And we go back to 54. The approach which he, Alan Robertson attributes to Morley, who I don't know, um, says, as a corollary, selection increases the approach to homozygosity, not only at loci carrying genes determining the character in question, but at all loci. And what's that saying? is that selection will increase delta F, 
But it's actually also saying a little bit stronger than that. It's, it's saying, well, more precise than that. It's saying that it's including through the development of pedigree alone, that the, pe the pedigree will develop differently and you will increase delta F. And that's an important point that was being made at the time. And then another idea that uh, this, coming back to this idea of inheritance of selective advantage, that all pairs of parents may have equal probabilities of contribution progeny to be measured, but some are more equal than others when it comes to selection. And so, and this is an important part of the Robertson paper. And what he was pointing out here, basically, is that we have a very serious gap in knowledge. We don't know anything about the rate of inbreeding that we would have in selected populations. Okay, that was in 61. And Robertson's paper continues by asserting that from a one-generation argument, he can, he can get a, an idea about what the effective population size is, as where F is a, he thinks about a full SIB family structure, and this F is a fraction of full SIB families that, that, that a particular family will contribute to the next generation. And from that, he gets some idea about what he thinks might be an estimate of delta F, or at least a, a step along the way. And uh, you can see that if you kind of simplify what he's saying in here, recognizing these are full SIB families, what he's saying basically is that delta F is a quarter of the uh, sum of squared initial contributions that an individual makes, not long term. But he makes another important step in here, is that it asserts that a unit selective advantage in a parent is a half in an offspring, it's a quarter in a grand offspring. So, so your ancestor's selective advantage gives half its power to its offspring, a quarter of power to its grand offspring, and an eighth of a power to its great grand offspring. And so it carries on like that. And on that basis, he says, well, an initial selective advantage is going to double over time, summing up all those uh, generations of descendants. And so he reckons that delta F will be four times bigger than expected. And that's the effect of an inherited selective advantage. And what I find remarkable about this paper is that the view of delta F is actually intuitively correct. Although, actually, there is no definition that I can find in the literature that ever justified that this should be any intuitive way of getting a delta F. So, what I, that's why I think the paper is remarkable. This is a Robertson paper. And so, although he's mistaken in appealing to a principle that just doesn't hold in selection, and there's no theoretical principles, he, he sort of puts a bit of an idea into place. And, uh, well, the formula did not match up with observations. They uh, predicted increases in delta F as a consequence, which, of course, is, is fine. But uh, they significantly overestimated the impact. And that was the state of the art for nearly 30 years. And so we come, as a background, admittedly uh, some gaps, but we come to Ray and Thompson, 1990. And the importance of that paper is that it provides us with a fundamental theorem. And let's have a look at some of the key points of why this paper is so uh, excellent and special. So remember the decomposition that uh, Robin was striving at in his 77. This is actually of the relationship matrix and taken out of his paper. And there he points out that the terms, or Ray, Naomi, and Robin point out that the terms are an averaging process and that those 
matrix uh, products were going to converge and they're going to converge to a contribution matrix C and that C has identical columns and that those columns are essentially the long-term contribution, a converged long-term contribution of an ancestor to the long-term gene pool. And so we have we have clearly connected the, the, uh, the products of the Zs with contributions. We now got contributions clearly on the agenda. And C is associated with the Mendelian sampling terms, these matrices here for every generation. So we've connected James with the structure of the A matrix and the contributions of Mendelian sampling terms, these contributions are associated with Mendelian sampling terms. So, if we come to the theorem, the theorem says that the rate of inbreeding is uh, a quarter of the sum of squared contributions. Now, that's not as Robin put it, quite. Robin scaled uh, it all as uh, he multiplied everything by m plus f, so his r was scaled by m plus f, and then he divided it through by the end, and I think it's just neater without that scaling. So essentially, it says that the rate of inbreeding is a quarter of the sum of squared long-term contributions, and that is a sum over a generation of ancestors, and it assumes random mating. Now, why is that important? Because that proof encompasses selection. And some common formulations that you will see in papers just do not cover selection. The, the gen drift of, a, of a, a neutral allele, the change in frequencies, do not encompass, in one generation, does not encompass selection. And you can simply modify this for pedigree non-randomness. It's not done in the paper, but it's... It's a form that can be, uh, uh, in, you can include non-random mating in there. It is strictly for classical neutral selection free locus, but you can also generate that to an infinitesimal model, which of course is very important since most of our selection schemes assume, or at least uh, benefit from being approximately like an infinitesimal model. And it also allows us to think about population structure on delta F. It's, it's kind of freeing it from saying, oh, let's have some full sib families, some half sib families. Let's say that it keeps the same in, in uh, does it matter which ones become parents? Does it matter whether we've got, got uh, some breeding males, some breeding females? It kind of takes it away from that the generality takes it away from that kind of detail, which I find important. And so it has filled a theoretical knowledge gap in that. Let's go back to selective advantages. And essentially, the question that was being asked by Robertson was, or asserted by Robertson, how does the selective advantage of a descendant depend on an ancestor. So here we have our ancestors and they have offspring and we have a selected set having offspring who are then again selected and sometime later we have uh, some descendants. So how does a selective advantage of an ancestor affect its descendants about whether they're going to get selected or not? And Robertson, if I just look at grand offspring here, Robertson predicts that the ancestors uh, uh, the, will have half their selective advantage of the ancestors will be transferred to the grand offspring. And Ray and Thompson, Naomi and Robin show that for, for mass selection, it is not a half, it is a half times 1 minus kh squared. And that is, of course, less than a half and it is about the selection amongst the offspring in this time here increases the competitiveness amongst the descendants. Only the best 
of the offspring from all the ancestors will be selected and that increases the, descend the competitiveness of descendants from each of the different ancestors. And that is one reason why Robertson uh, obtained an overestimate. But the important point is that that uh, principle establishes the general principles for inheritance of selective <coughs> advantage across generations, which of course is, is fundamental to population change. Now the paper itself goes on to make accurate predictions of, of delta F in mass selection. It uses a recursive algorithm which uh, from par predicting pathway extensions but uh, the paper itself doesn't have a closed form. But that really the, the principles that it had set out and the gaps that it had filled in, to my mind, absolutely fundamental. So if we just look very briefly going beyond uh, Ray and Thompson, why does that help us? Well, okay, uh, we wrote, I, I spent a long time simplifying Robin's recursion in terms of exactly what, what this recursion was. Uh, and you can see you end up with rather a messy closed form, although it is a closed form. It's not very nice at the top there. It doesn't look very good. But uh, in some ways, that's just a stepping stone. It's, but you can generalize this. The paper was about mass selection, but it could, have, it could be anything to do with truncation selection. Uh, although the theorem is general, the the uh, principles that he set out in the recursion were general to anything in truncation selection. And you can simplify the prediction, really, with a bit more work. In other words, you, one of the terms that's implicit in the Ray and Thompson paper, although never actually made terribly explicit, is the, is the expected long-term contribution of an ancestor if you conditional on its particular selective advantages. And you can show that actually the delta F is, is really very simply just the expected square of that expression. And so uh, in terms of, for example, uh, if you had random selection, the expected contribution of each ancestor is simply 1 over 2M for males and 1 over 2F for females. And you square it up and divide by 2 and you'll get raised rights for them. Anyway, so beyond that you can get... Uh, Achievable lower bounds for delta F, which you can uh, map out in, and, and the schemes by which you can actually achieve that in conservation terms. And it's also unifying in the sense that, okay, what we have now is an expression of delta F as something to do with long-term contributions. And in fact, you can show that the rate of gain is also fundamentally concerned with long-term contributions in identifying those with the best Mendelian sampling terms, those that are bringing something new to the population, and ensuring that they make the largest contributions. And you then get, sorry, this is the only time I'm going to mention the optimal contributions, you then get a maximum you can then work out maximum gains for constrained delta Fs, both algorithmically and theoretically. And we can clarify the role of non-random mating, which is the important. All these come from the, the, the theorems and the understanding of uh, the way that inbreeding uh, arises through the Ray and Thompson paper, including something such as the correlation structure of incremental drift over generations. So, summary. And it's a short summary, and it's Robin's contributions to contributions, or what I consider the most important ones. And it's the establishing the significance and value of contributions. And here, I should say that to some extent, I come sideways into livestock and livestock breeding and quantitative genetics. Even when I joined ABRO, I spent 
my first paper was on copper metabolism and I spent a good 10 or a dozen years doing uh, biochemical research and indeed uh, the career grade promotion was based on my work with growth hormone and so coming in to quantitative genetics I perhaps ha don't have a historic view that maybe someone versed in that topic would have had. So when I say this, this is a personal view in the sense that when I came into the quantitative genetics, I considered everything kind of a, a one-generation argument. It was gain was intensity times accuracy times genetic standard deviation. So what's the, what's the intensity of this generation? What's the accuracy of this generation? Was all it depended on was what was happening now. Even when we went to delta F, uh, we were obviously constrained in what we could say, but it was very much a generation, uh, a drift of one ge across one generation of, a, of a, an allele was the most common way that people talked about it. And you had these formulae which were rather static in the way that they looked at it. And if you look at that theorem, what that theorem is talking about is that it's talking about the continuous impact of an individual over time and the spread of its genes through the population. In other words, it is actually saying something which I kind of vaguely thought, well, what's happening to the genes from uh, this influential, you know, how's it spreading? And what impact does that have? And that idea of multiple generations having impact, not just what's happening now, but what happened, what's the processes, the dynamics of what's happening, was to me a liberating idea that multiple generations were important. And fundamentally, this is one of the most important uh, uh, theorems that uh, we have in quantitative genetics, population genetics, because it is connecting the loss of variation to the population and selection. 